Hello, Alex here, and today we're going to introduce a new mini series on the safe handling and disposal of film development chemicals that we handle on a daily basis. In the first episode of this mini series, we're going to talk about probably the most boring part, but one of the more important parts how to read a safety data sheet or SDS and actually interpret the information contained within it so that you know what it means in a practical sense. Let's get into it. So firstly, my background and why I'm the one talking about this. I have a PhD in organometallic chemistry, which is pretty relevant in a broad sense to photographic film development, but I also did work a lot with reduction of metals and a little bit of work with silver. During my studies, I took on a huge interest in how chemical waste is dealt with, neutralized and disposed of, because we inherited a huge number of old chemicals from the previous occupants of the lab that we worked in, and a lot of it just had to be dealt with and figuring out what you can use to like mutually neutralize each other and then what you actually need to pay someone to come and get rid of, that interested me a lot. And in my current job, chemical waste disposal is one of my main duties, from flammable organic waste to corrosive aqueous waste to the more niche things like occasionally some radioactives, alkali metals, heavy metal waste, all that kind of thing. I handle that on a daily basis. So I feel like I'm pretty well equipped to at least present the information to you. What you decide to do with it is up to you. I also want to be very, very clear that any recommendations or opinions I give in these videos are just that. They are not legally binding. They do not in any way overrule your local ordinances and laws. Check with your city, your county, whoever, before you put anything down the sink. I'm just telling you what I think is okay in Dublin, Ireland, based on my experience. That's all I'm going to say about that. An SDS, or safety data sheet, is a document which outlines the physical and chemical properties, first aid measures, exposure and protection measures, environmental hazards, etc., of any chemical or chemical mixture. Older names for an SDS include MSDS and PSDS for material safety data sheet and product safety data sheet, but those names are deprecated. If you find a file for a developer or fixer that you're using and it says MSDS or PSDS, that's fine. It just means it's a bit old. Speaking of old, an SDS should be updated approximately every two to three years. However, in our case, it doesn't matter that much. They're updated because it might turn out in the future that some chemicals that we use now are found out to be toxic in some way. And the SDS will be updated to include that toxicological information. So, you know, the old SDSs wouldn't actually reflect the risks associated with the chemical in those instances. But for our purposes, most of the actual specific chemicals we're dealing with are pretty well known and established, so there's nothing really likely to change. But that doesn't mean it won't, it's just not so likely. Realistically, if you find an SDS that's from the last 5, maybe 10 years, it's probably fine. Under the Global Harmonized System for the Classification and Labeling of Chemicals, or just GHS for short, there is a standard format for an SDS and the pictograms also used are standardized. Realistically, an SDS is meant for use in a commercial setting, so someone working with large amounts of these materials in a factory, for example, rather than us who would work with things on a much smaller scale, you know, fractions of a gram, tens of milliliters, that kind of thing. It's not necessarily directed at us, so some of the risks in an SDS don't accurately reflect the, the level of risk um, that we would be exposed to in a film development setting. It is actually quite uncommon, unfortunately, for an SDS to distinguish between large-scale and small-scale use cases. However, the one that we're going to discuss today does in fact do that, and that's a good example to have. The GHS framework specifies 16 different sections that must be included in an SDS, and I'm not going to pretend to know them off by heart, I'm just going to read them off the screen. But here they are, and the ones in italics are the ones that are probably most important for our purposes when developing films safely. These include identification of the substance or mixture and the company slash undertaking, hazards identification, composition slash information on the ingredients, first aid measures, firefighting measures, 
accidental release measures, handling and storage, exposure controls slash personal protection, physical and chemical properties, stability and reactivity, toxicological information, ecological information, disposal considerations, transport information, regulatory information, and any other information that is pertinent and needs to be included. So if you're looking for an SES, how do you actually find one? The simple thing to do is look up the name of the product, such as Ilford Rapid Fixer SDS. That's all. Every manufacturer is legally obliged to supply one either on their website or at the very least, make it available by email in some way, but it should be available just to download straight as a PDF. Then you can download the PDF, have a look through it, maybe print it off if you want to, especially if you're keeping huge amounts of this material around, you might be legally required to keep an SDS on file, check your local laws, and then you can use the information contained within to figure out how to safely handle what you're working with. So now we're going to look at an actual SDS, in this case, household bleach. I downloaded an SDS for household bleach from Merck, one of the big chemical suppliers, because bleach is something that most of us will have familiarity with. So we will be able to get a sense of like the translation between SDS speak and practical considerations. This is also a good example because the SDS in this case is actually slightly out of date. It was issued in 2017, which means it's probably about two years out of date by the time this video goes live. So section one here tells us the full product name, its catalog number, and whether or not it is a mixture. Even a simple developer like Rodinal is multiple chemicals contained within the same solution, so it's important to know what exactly you're dealing with. Here we see that the bleach is about 6 to 14% active chlorine, so it's a bit stronger than actual household bleach, which I think is normally 4 to 8%, but that's close enough for our purposes. Sections 1.2, 1.3, and 1.4 aren't really relevant for our purposes. Section 2 is where it gets a bit spicy though, the hazards identification. This is where we see, most importantly, our hazard pictograms here. These two pictograms are two of the GHS standard pictograms. These are corrosive and environmentally hazardous. That means you don't want to get it on your skin or in your eyes, and you don't want to pour it down the sink. Now, obviously, we pour bleach down the sink, you use it to clean your sink, you might use it to clean your bath, your toilet. This is one of those cases where it's talking about huge environmental considerations. Like this means don't pour 10,000 gallons of bleach down the drain. That's not talking about us. We also have the H and P statements, the hazard statements and precautionary statements. If you want to look into these in any more detail when looking at a chemical, you can, but it's probably not too relevant for us beyond what's actually contained in the pictograms. Here we see the nicest part of this SDS, the reduced labeling. When dealing with small amounts, as in less than 125 milliliters of this slightly concentrated bleach, the pictograms are the same, but the overall H&P statements are slightly different because the risks are lessened when dealing with a smaller amount. That's something I want to emphasize that, again, and I know, I know I'm repeating myself, this is talking about every use case from using a shot glass worth of bleach in a mop bucket up to 10,000 gallons in a giant tank. It has to cover everything, so it's nice that this includes a reduced labeling section, which is not common, as I mentioned, unfortunately. Section 2.3, other hazards, none known. That's good for us. Section 3, composition slash information on ingredients. As I mentioned, it's very rare that something we use is going to be a pure chemical, meaning a single chemical as an aqueous solution. So it's good to know exactly what we're dealing with. And there's a lot of useful information in here because you may not actually be able to get an SDS for the overall mixture for some reason. So it's good to be able to look up what's in your developer, for example, and look up the individual components separately, which you can do. There's nothing wrong with that. So here we see that the bleach is an aqueous solution. That means the bleach is dissolved in water. So that's six to 14%. Section 3.2 tells us what exactly the mixture is. So we see the name of the chemical, the concentration and the cast number. That is one of the most important things to take note of if you want to look into these chemicals in your developers or fixers in any more detail. The cast number, um, I don't know what cast number actually stands for. I'll look it up and I'll put it in the text down below. 
It is a unique identification number for every single chemical. If you take, for example, sodium carbonate or washing soda or baking soda, sodium hydrogen carbonate, sodium bicarbonate, you can have multiple names for a single chemical, trivial and scientific names. And even within scientific names, you can have, you know, multiple names like toluene and methylbenzene. But a CAS number is the same regardless of what name you use. So if you want to look up a chemical, you can actually just Google that CAS number and you can pull these from Wikipedia. If you don't know, you know, what the CAS number is, you can look up 4-aminophenol and get the CAS number off of Wikipedia that way. It's very easy to look things up if you use the CAS number, so it's important to do that. Then it gives you some of the H phrases, the most pertinent ones, for each specific component within that mixture. Here we see that there are no other uh, components listed here. Now, okay, this is spread across two pages, but there's nothing listed here or here, which means that the remainder of the 100% is just water because we stated above, it's an aqueous solution. So that 8 to 14%, 10 to 20% bleach is whatever percent bleach, sodium hypochlorite, and the rest is just water in this case. Section four, first aid measures. It's important to know what you should do as well as what you should not do, because for a lot of chemicals, if you ingest them, it's actually recommended not to induce vomiting because you're safe for corrosives. Rhodonol is a good one. Sodium hypochlorite is another classic example you hear about in first aid courses or on chemical safety adverts on TV warning you to keep stuff away from kids. Your stomach is surprisingly good at uh, containing corrosive chemicals. Shocker, hydrochloric acid, stomach acid is corrosive. So if you get you know, corroded on the way down, your esophageal lining gets damaged, if you force vomiting or induce vomiting, you're going to cause more damage when that stuff comes back up. So for certain chemicals, it will tell you what not to do as well as what to do, and it's important to know that. However, the amounts of chemicals that we're going to be working with are actually quite small. Like I mentioned, you know, you stand develop with rhodonol, it's probably five milliliters of material. It's not a lot. But then again, if you're making up, you know, um, a half kilo bag of uh, Kodak D76 into four liters, that's a lot of powder and there are risks associated with powders that aren't associated with solutions. So it is important to check this kind of thing because in that case, um, aerosolization of the powder and inhalation could be a more serious risk and there can be some specific problems that you might have to deal with. So in this case, okay, after inhalation, get fresh air, call in a physician, because if you breathe it in, it can damage your mucous membranes. In case of skin contact, take off all contaminated clothing, rinse with water or a shower. That's pretty obvious. If you've ever gotten a bleach burn from cleaning, you know it's not the most comfortable thing, so just wash it off your hands immediately. If you get it in your eyes, there we go. Remove contact lenses if safe and easy to do so. It is important to remove contact lenses if you get chemicals in your eyes, but sometimes maybe someone is in incredible amounts of pain and you cannot get their hands off their eyes. You can't do it in that case, but you should try because the chemicals can in, uh, soak into contact lenses or get behind them and then cause effectively a locally concentrated region of whatever the hazardous material is that can cause higher levels of damage. Most important symptoms and effects, both acute and delayed. Risk of blindness. Bleach can blind you if it gets in your eyes. You do not want to get bleach in your eyes. It's incredibly corrosive. Uh, irritation and corrosion, cough, shortness of breath. If you've ever breathed in bleach by accident, you know exactly how that feels. Section five, firefighting measures. Most of what we deal with is aqueous solutions in water, so there isn't really any risk. However, if you're dealing with a powder, powders of any sort from flour, to aluminium can cause a fire risk if dispersed into the air. So if you're working with a powder, do it in a ventilated area, maybe even outside if the weather is dry, just to get it into you know the, the initial amount of water and then you can fully dissolve it up later. Just be safe about it. Accidental release measures. What to do if it gets into the drain, on the floor, out and about. For our purposes, this doesn't really matter because we use bleaches to clean bathrooms, like I said before. So all this information here about covering drains you know, pumping off spills, collecting and binding, doesn't really apply to our purposes unless you spill a five gallon drum of bleach on the floor, whatever. That's not really, you know, within the scope of what I'm talking about in this series, so we won't worry about that. Section seven, handling and storage. 
This can be important depending on what your material is. Some of our developers are sensitive to oxygen or sensitive to light. Oxygen more so, especially like C41 and E6 developers. That information will be disclosed in this part of the SDS if it's relevant to the material that you're talking about and you will need to take appropriate actions such as using like a, a butane protection spray or maybe one, maybe one of those folding accordion bottles that you can squash the air out of, something like that. Exposure controls and personal protection. This is not again really within the scope of what we're talking about. It says you need to use a respirator with bleach down. So it does actually say that you should wear a respirator when handling your bleach, but again, that's on massive industrial scale, not really for our purposes. Just open a window if you're using bleach, it's fine at small scale. Physical and chemical properties. This will tell you what the material is supposed to look like, if it's a solution, a powder, if it has a color, you know, things like its pH, melting point, boiling point, flash point, if it's flammable, if it's a powder, and any powder can be flammable, water solubility, density, viscosity, these kind of things don't matter too much for our purposes, but they can be useful for certain things. Section 10, stability and reactivity. This is a good one because it will tell you about chemical incompatibility. I'm not sure if there's anything I know off offhand. Rodinol, potassium hydroxide. You shouldn't store rodinol in a glass bottle because it can etch away the glass and over a long period of time, admittedly, it can damage and eventually destroy the bottle. That's a consideration that you would need to make. And that's the kind of thing that would be disclosed in this section here. For example, <laughs> bleach reacts with flammable gases, acids, any kind of metal pretty much because it's such a powerful oxidizer. And in all cases, it will give you lovely chlorine gas, which will mess you up in even worse ways. It will also tell you if there are any conditions to avoid, such as excessive heat, shock, friction, sparks, anything like that. Section 11, toxicological information. And this refers back to the first aid information somewhat. The first aid is more short term. This is more long term stuff. So obviously we see dermal toxicity, skin irritation, eye irritation, inhalation toxicity. That's the more first aid stuff. The important parts in this section for our purposes are down here. Sensitization, carcinogenicity, teratogenicity, reproductive toxicity. Can this material give you cancer? Can it make you infertile? Some of the things that we actually work with are very bad in this regard, and it's important to pay attention here. Section 12, ecological information. This will tell you if the material bioaccumulates in soil or in the food chain, something like mercury or certain pesticides can do that. And it will also tell you the general biodegradability, um, how much of a problem it is if it gets out into the, the environment. In the case of bleach, it's not that it builds up, but it's just that it straight up kills things. You know, if you were drinking bleach, and you're a fish, you're not going to have a good time. In this case, it does note that discharge into the environment must be avoided. Again, that's a large scale thing, not really for our purposes. Section 13, disposal considerations. This is good because it will tell you what you need to do or not do to dispose of or neutralize your waste. So in the case of bleach, disposed of in accordance with national and local regulations. No mixing with other waste because you don't want to start a fire or give off chlorine gas. I mean, bleach is a pretty simple one in this regard. We'll see some much more uh, complex disposal considerations in future videos. Transport information. This will be stuff like UN codes, UN 1791, or packing groups, environmentally hazardous, you know, yes, no flags. This is realistically for the shipping company who's actually going to be transporting this to wherever, from factories to suppliers. Section 15, regulatory information. Again, this is just you know, regulatory directorial codes, they don't really affect us in any way. Section 16, other information. This is where you can get the full text of the H statements referred to in sections two and three. You can look them up on Wikipedia. There are tables there. I'll put a link to that in the description down below, but the SDS should in section 16 give the full expanded versions of that. So H314 and H400 in this case are that bleach causes severe skin burns and eye damage and is very toxic to aquatic life. You'll also see the signal word, pictograms, etc., all over again. This information is presented earlier on in the SDS, so it's not too big a deal. So look, I hope this video has been useful to you. Um, it was a bit long and I will not be spending anywhere near as much time on it in future videos. I'm going to assume in my future videos that you're familiar with an SDS to some degree, and I'll just skim over the most important and relevant parts to whatever developer, fixer, 
etc. that we're going to be talking about. I hope you now have a better understanding of what an SDS means, contains and represents, especially with regard to its limitations uh, to disclosing the level of risk in a reasonable manner to small scale personal uses. The fact that they are meant to cover more or less every possible use case regardless of scale is a limitation of an SDS, but you should be able to appreciate that there is a lot of useful information contained in here regardless. I'm not entirely sure what chemical to cover next, maybe rhodanol, I think that's a pretty safe and standard one to go with, so we might do that. We'll see. If you don't already, make sure to follow me on Instagram at chaco1277 for new pictures every single day. So that is the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it, stay safe, and bye bye for now. If you like this video and enjoy what I do, please consider subscribing or checking out my Patreon where the tiers start at just one euro per month.